Hi there. Thanks for uh, joining this online talk. I hope you're uh, doing all right in this uh, in these trying times. My name is Matthijs van der Laar. I'm the creative director at Trollbound. We're a small Dutch game development company um, focusing on entertainment games and more specifically on 3D action adventure titles. At least we try to. Um, and this talk is about our previous game that we launched last year. Um, and it's specifically about the storytelling in that game because the game is run on a simulation and it's an autonomous game world and this talk is about how you tell a story through that autonomous game world even you sometimes don't know the situation now before I do um, I want to show you the trailer for the game so that you can get a general sense of what it's like to, uh, to play it I'll cut it off a bit there. Um, so Pine is, as I said, it's a 3D open world action adventure game. Uh, it's quite a mouthful um, and, and not a genre a lot of indies tackle, but we had the knowledge in-house and we thought we'd uh, want to try that. I think a lot of developers would try that if they gotten the chance, if they got the chance. Um, it came out on Steam in October last year and later on Switch in November uh, after a few delays. Um, and it's about 20 hours long for most players, uh, a bit more for some, um, but the general time frame has been 20 hours for a lot of people. And it's a completely story-driven single-player game, right? So there's no online component to it or co-op component, it's just, uh, yeah, you and the story. So Pine is set in a world where there's been an alternate evolution, right? Um, humans never reached the top of the food chain, and instead a lot of animals got the chance to develop culture and language of their own, meaning that the humans are actually the, the lowest form of, uh, of, of life on this, on this, uh, in this island, in this game world. And the game features uh, a simulated ecology to emphasize that, that backstory. Um, and this means that there are five factions in the game, and those factions constantly fight over food and resources and territory and survival. And amidst all of that, you're playing as you, a young human, uh, who needs to find a new place for the humans to live. Um, and I'll get into that later. The most important backbone for the game, and I think it's also important to um, yeah, explain a bit of that technology, is the simulated ecology. As I said, there are five factions, and they are organized in the game world with a dynamic village system. So we have all these locations on the island on, in the game world uh, where villages could exist, where these factions live. Um, and this is dynamic, so we do a die roll at the start of the game, and any faction could inhabit any village at any time. Um, and this is a really important backbone because it's a fully autonomous system, right? The player cannot be around or not even interact with it, and this will still happen continuously on the background. So you can you can see fights in front of your eyes, you can see gatherers take the resources that the player can also gather. Um, and we wanted to really give this feeling of a really, you know, living, breathing world like that. Obviously, those factions need a face and a name. Um, and in our case, these are uh, the five uh, creatures that we went for, right? They are all based on an animal or a, a hybrid of animals. Um, and all of them have a different culture. So they like different items. They talk a bit differently. At least they, you know, their whole, their whole embodiment of things is a bit different. Um, and they wear different clothes, they use different items, and it's important that we separate these so that players could have, you know, an affection to some of them and a bit less to others, like you feel a real connection to some of them. 
as I said, they live in these villages, right? And this is what a village could look like. This is a gobbledoo village, which is the bird creature that you just saw somewhere in the dunes area. And this is a tier B village from what I can see at the totem because it has two flames. And I know that it can be tier A, B or C. Um, and B being the neutral one, it's sort of mid-size. They're not super strong, but they're like doing well for themselves. Uh, on the right side, you can see the chief. Uh, a bit right from the totem, you can see the eating area. So there's these different elements that compose a village. This is another one. It's a bit smaller. It has these huge fishing poles, um, which is more of a backstory thing. This is the Caribbeans, the moose people. They live here. It's a bit smaller. I see one flame on the totem. There's also this one. And it was important for us that these villages were really um, intertwined with the environment that it didn't feel just like you know some sockets that were placed but it feels like a real place in any situation you find the villages but for those with a sharp eye you might have seen in the trailer already that this system is visualized um, very well in this little bit where you can see that this same village this so the same village position on this island can have any of the species living inside it right so we interchange the prefabs, the, the objects like the houses and the eating places with the one that fits the culture that lives there. And we also sometimes interchange it with natural environmental assets, like the tree on the left, so that you can really get this feeling of the village changing over time and, and based on who is in there. So those villages on the background, they're um, governed by a village commander, as we call it, which is a sort of agent that gives them a schedule for gathering and raiding and eating and sleeping. And that's completely based on their current state and the needs that the village has. So if they're very hungry, they're going to send out more groups to gather food, right? Or if they need to start building more buildings, they're going to need materials for that and gather those. Um, if they have a nearby village that's not, that's not doing really well, they might want to raid it if they're not friends with each other because, you know, you can get a lot of loot out of that. Um, and even on an individual level, we let these organisms eat and sleep based on what they need. So you get this whole breathing autonomous system of, of creatures constantly roaming around for their own merit and for their own goals, trying to survive. And it's important that, you know, the player interacts with that. One last interesting part about the simulation is that we uh, figured that across the whole game world, which is around four square kilometers, we cannot possibly be simulating this in a, a very detailed way, right? So we, we thought of something uh, of a dissection between a simulation space and a real space. Now, the simulation space is more of a virtual network on which all these organisms operate, right? So imagine these are sort of highways and the organisms are little dots on this highway and we can send them out of a village to gather some food and we know where the food is so we, we bring them to those nodes and they bring it back. But we don't have to visualize that, this is just data doing that, right? It takes some time to get there, etc. If two groups would meet on this highway, we would just roll a dice and, you know, try to figure out who would win between these two species based on their, their current status. Um, but we wouldn't actually, you know, emulate the whole fight because that's not necessary. But then when the player comes closer, you obviously want to see everything in detail and you want to interact with it. So that's, that's when we start visualizing things, right? These organisms become real organisms with animations and attacks and VFX. And for example, you could witness a fight like this where two groups are meeting. I see one in the background coming up as well. Um, and they're going to fight and you as a player can just walk past this or you can help either one of them or you can decide what to do with this, right? Because in the end, it's all about the player. And that was for us the, the interesting angle. We could make a simulation game, but you have hundreds of those and a lot of studios doing that better. But we wanted to take the angle of what if a single player game, an action adventure game is set in a world like this, that it's more autonomous. So you play as a you, which is a, as I said, a young member of the human tribe. Um, the tribe being not on top of the food chain, which is a very important uh, aspect of the story. And these people also took a slightly different evolutionary course, right? This was interesting in terms of character design because we wanted to give them very big feet and slightly different autonomy, uh, sorry, uh, anatomy, but we wanted to make sure that they were so recognizable and relatable as humans. So we see them here in the, in the base human village. And this is also where the game starts, right? You start in the human camp, which is in complete isolation, and the habitat of the humans is becoming naturally very unstable. Uh, it's clear that they cannot live here for much longer. So the inciting incident is also about a sort of terrible uh, tragedy that happens to this village um, that uh, causes the main character, you, to act and, and go out in the world for the first time to see if there are solutions outside the, 
the, the human world. So this introduction all takes place here and it's very linear. It, it gives us a chance to teach the player the mechanics and to introduce the problems and the stakes uh, that are there in the world. And it's a very secluded area. It's, it's cut off by rivers and by height difference, so it's not relating to the rest of the world at all. It takes about 30 to 45 minutes, and the good thing about that is that um, this allows the simulation to warm up a little bit, right? We have all these systems going on in the background in this autonomous game world, and by having this introduction, we allow ourselves to you know, keep this going and um, make sure that interesting stuff is already happening when the player reaches it. Because at some point, the player actually does have to get into the open world, of course, and start interacting with all these things. Now, this is where it gets really interesting, because how do you combine a sort of linear story that people might expect in this genre with a fully systemic design that I just explained? To illustrate that, I want to take you through the first quest or the first steps of the first quest that we designed. Um, the quest is called First Humble Steps, and we introduce a few more characters in this case, uh, especially a, a mentor-like character called Oth. He's a, he's a sort of monkey who's aware of the whole politics on this island, and he knows how things work. Uh, but he's very neutral, he's like Switzerland in this whole story, right? Um, and the quest that he gives you is not go there or go to that village. The quest is actually find a village. Um, and this is interesting because this means that um, our whole thinking process was never to guide the player through the world in a very linear way, um, but make it as open as possible and allow them to interact with the simulation however they want. Because it's an entirely free start to this game, right? You can literally choose any village you want, also on the other, uh, other end of the, of the map. However, we do sort of nudge the player into a direction. For example, on the right here on the screen, you can see this is a, a village that's in the back. And most players go to this village because it's, you know, it's in your face, kind of. But, you know, this is the corner where this takes place. The player comes in around the arrow. Um, you can see the village on the beach and in the, in the bottom right. But very close by are other villages as well. So this is the one on the beach, but you might as well just enter here and start your quest here, right? What would happen? Well, this is the whole system behind questing inside the simulation. There's a lot of questions you need to ask, like does this village even exist? Because villages can also go extinct or based on the first die roll, they can, the village cannot exist at all. Also who's inside the village and what's used relationship? What's the player's relationship to them? Um, because if everyone's just friends with you, there's not much of a conflict, right? So that's important system there as well. Luckily, there's a big solution in systemic design, as some of you might be aware of. Um, for example, we have a dynamic affinity system that throughout the whole game allows you to constantly change your relationships with these creatures by your actions, right? So if you trade with them or if you fight with them, if you defeat their enemies, stuff like that, this will gain you affinity points with them. But if you hit them in the face or if you trade the wrong things to them, their affinity will obviously drop. It's also important that you give many tools and influencers to the players, um, that they have a lot of ways of influencing this instead of, you know, a single button doing something. Uh, to really make this feel alive and keep that immersion in there. We also really rely on dynamic quest nodes everywhere. So instead of, again, saying go to village A, we say go to A village, and that will, you know, be based on variables. Other than that, we also need a lot of fallbacks, because if you go to that village and the quest progresses within that village, and then suddenly you become enemies again with those people, um, we need a fallback solution of, you know, try to regain their trust or become friends with them again. Otherwise, you cannot interact with them. So here are examples of that, right? We have on the left, you see a donation box, which was important because entering a village when they're not friends with you is not a good idea. They'll start hitting you immediately, right? But with a donation box that's placed just outside a village, you can donate some items, especially the ones that they like, to gain their trust and their friendship. Um, and we also introduce items like influencers, like a peace treaty that instantly makes you friends with them that you can trade into these boxes. On the bottom right, you can see an example of the affinity system. If I lock onto an enemy or onto a creature, uh, it will give a shimmer of color of showing, you know, this is, this is an enemy or a friend. In this case, definitely an enemy, uh, which is useful in combat. But also when you see them on a distance, we do that shimmer again automatically so that you, yeah, you always know who you're dealing with. There is, of course, also combat, which is a big thing in this genre and in this this type of game. Um, hitting someone in the face obviously won't make friends, right? So that's one of the clearest tools that the player has to uh, to express their feelings against uh, a species, I guess. 
the trading system is also pretty pretty broad in this sense um you can trade all kinds of items to these to these creatures we don't really have a, a common currency like gold but we have an item economy which is not always uh, recommended i would say to do because it takes a lot of work to balance this stuff out but the cool thing is <clears throat> as you can see in the top right um, that we gave these creatures a valuation of items, right? We we could indicate which items they would like and which they would really not like that much. And in the middle of the trading screen, you see the affinities and you see the balancing scale. And you can try to make your trade so that, you know, you make m the most out of your relationship with them after trading. Um, and that you also balance the scale in terms of worth for these items. The questing note system, we, we built a quest system from the ground up because we knew we needed a lot of specific things, right? In this case, we, for example, in this graph, we check uh, all the affinities with all the species and we're hoping that one of them is friends with you so that we can progress the quest, right? In the first quest, we say find a village, but before that, you need to be friends with someone. So before we actually progress the quest, we ask you to donate some items to someone. doesn't matter who it is, as long as it's someone, so that we can, you know, dynamically check if you're friends with at least anyone. Or this one, for example, you know, all the way in the left, we do get the current village. So what village am I in? Then we check the species, who does this village belong to, and then am I enemies with this species? Because if so, I probably need to change my quest into, you know, run away or get to safety or try to become friends before progressing again. As you can imagine, there were quite a lot of problems with this um, and quite a few things that even in the end we didn't get right. Um, one of them, one of the more important ones in terms of storytelling is the idea of having deliberate characters, right? On the right, for example, you see a chief of one of the first big villages that you find. Um, and the chief has a bunch of lines progressing the story and outlining what you need to do. But these lines are the same for all factions. So if we had a lot more production time, we would have obviously tried to flavor them compared to or based on what species is stalking. Uh, but we didn't have that luxury. So you lose a little bit of character in, in the conversations and in, in the quests that you're making because it becomes more generic this way, right? They do all have a name which is generated, um, but it's hard to make them really memorable if you if you don't really, you know, have a character bio written for them. This is a systemic character problem. In other instances, we just relied on making a very specific character like this one, which is who's called Grop, and he has a little shop, uh, making making human things with with his very huge hands. Um, and the problem here is that he's completely outside of the simulation, which is a bit sad, right? He lives in a cave. He doesn't really uh, belong to anything or any of the systems. Um, but we had to rely on that to, to get across some of the story without constantly having to involve the politics of the simulation in there. One of the last bigger problems that we have with the simulation and the storytelling is something we call the wall problem. Um, Basically, the simulation gives a lot of results and effects, but it can come across as random. The reason it's called the wall problem is because that's one of the most prominent examples. In the screenshot, you see uh, a place called a vault, which is sort of a dungeon, if you compare it in, in action adventure um, sort of terms. Um, entering the vault is all fine, but when you exit the vault, there might be a wall popping up of a species that you've never seen before. And this is because even during your time in the vault, the simulation just keeps going, right? So somebody else might have taken over that village that you, you were just in and you come out and uh, suddenly everyone starts attacking you. And this is completely by design, but it can come across as very random. And for a lot of people, uh, they could think this is sort of bugged or, or broken, right? Because this is not how they left the situation. So it's really important that you constantly inform the player of what's happening. You do that in advance, you know, indicating uh, thoroughly in the game that things could possibly change. Um, but also when it happens, you need to visualize what is happening if, if something is changing. So for that, for example, you have buildings retracting in the ground with a lot of dust and smoke. Um, and also after the fact, you need to indicate, you know, what has happened uh, here with the simulation. And this stuff took a lot of time to make, but also to test, right? We didn't exactly know where these question marks were. So we, we relied on a lot of static uh, solutions uh, that didn't work in all cases. Luckily, there are probably a lot of solutions and references for this, right? This was our first attempt at doing something of this scale um, and this caliber. Um, we do think that with more production time, a lot of these things are solved, right? Especially uh, the, the, the problem with the, the generic characters, you can get a lot more thought in if you, for example, add uh, flavor tags where 
there are certain sentences that uh, these creatures always say and you insert them in those lines if it's that species. Um, a game that's doing this really well is the Nemesis system in Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor. Um, they took quite a plunge with this system. Uh, it, it's super intricate and super interesting. Many of you might have heard of it before. Um, but basically they really embrace the idea of having um, a generic system where you could fight enemies and the enemies would actually remember your actions and they all have names and character traits and stuff like that and it's really well done um, because they tell stories with systemic design and that's one of the most powerful things games can do right it's it's heavily relying on the systems and the interactive nature of it that actually recognizing what you're doing as a player and changing the board for the for the better is, is a really cool thing um, there's also a small studio you might have heard of that's doing a lot of this uh, called Ubisoft who call this Anecdote Factories, right? This is uh, something they've been embracing for years right now. Um, I think the origins are with Far Cry. Um, but right now, for example, Watch Dogs Legion is a, is a huge example of uh, applying the systemic design and also trying to get more dynamic characters going um, with these systems. And that's a that's a really cool thing to see that even the bigger studios are are tackling this. So I think there's a really bright feature future, and I hope that more studios, just like us, even though we're a bit small, uh, will try to uh, get their hands on stuff like this. All right, I think that's it. I think there's time for some questions now, and uh, yeah, I want to thank you very much. Bye.